more crimes in non-international armed conflict, are serious breaches of international humanitarian law, which, one, entail individual criminal responsibility under conventional or customary international law, and two, are committed in the context of a non-international armed conflict. As we did for war crimes committed in international armed conflict, let's examine separately these two main elements. Firstly, as we saw earlier, traditionally, the notion of war crimes is limited to international armed conflicts. Neither Common Article 3 to the Four Geneva Convention, nor Additional Protocol 2, contains a grave breach his provisions similar to the one contained in the Four Geneva Conventions and in Additional Protocol 1. Indeed, states were not ready to accept that first state could be involved in the prosecutions and trials of individuals that had committed atrocities in the context of a non-international armed conflict occurring in the territory of another state. This position was radically altered in the context of the war in the former Yugoslavia. The ICTY created to try and prosecute the atrocities committed during that conflict affirmed that violations of international humanitarian law committed in the context of non-international armed conflict also entail individual criminal responsibility under international law and that the ICTY had jurisdictions over such crimes. Indeed, in the famous Tadic judgment of 2 October 1995, the ICTY appeals judges clearly recognize that, under customary international law, many norms of humanitarian law applicable in international armed conflicts apply equally in non-international armed conflicts and that violations of such norms entail individual criminal responsibility under customary international law irrespective of the character of the conflict in question. This important evolution was ultimately reflected in Article 4 of the ICTR Statute, which provides for jurisdiction of the ICTR over violations of Common Article 3 to the four Geneva Conventions and over Additional Protocol 2. Such recognition made perfect sense in light of the primarily internal character of the conflict in Rwanda. Without it, many atrocities would have been left unpunished. In the same vein, Articles 3 and 4 of the Statute of the Special Court for Sierra Leone provide for jurisdictions of this court over war crimes committed during uh, the civil war in Sierra Leone, and Article 8 C and D of the Statute of the ICC also contains an extensive list of war crimes that can be committed in non-international armed conflicts. This evolution has led Professor Nerlich to conclude that, for the purposes of the law of war crime, the distinctions between international and non-international armed conflict has become to some extent obsolete. However, he added that the approximation of the laws has not yet been complete. The list of war crimes applicable in non-international armed conflict in Article A2 C and E of the ICC Statute is considerably shorter than that for international armed conflicts. This is particularly true for prohibited means and methods of warfare over which the ICC does not have jurisdictions in non-international armed conflicts, despite the fact that the ICTY had considered that under customary international law, the use of such prohibited means and methods was criminal, not only in international armed conflicts, but also in non-international armed conflicts. Second, in order to constitute a war crime, a criminal conduct must be committed in the context of a non-international armed conflict. We will not discuss in this video the questions that are raised by the link that must exist between the criminal conduct 
and the non-international armed conflict, please refer to what we have said in this regard when examining the concept of war crimes in international armed conflict. It is, however, important to recall here that in order to qualify as a war crime, a criminal conduct must be closely related to the hostilities. Identifying this close relationship may prove to be particularly difficult in non-international armed conflicts where the distinctions between civilians and combatants is often blurred by the nature of the hostilities. As rightly pointed out by Professor Cassese, in contrast to international armed conflict, things are less clear in international armed conflict. Here, in addition to the fact that governments face rebels having the same nationality as government officials, civilians sometimes engage in fighting and attack other civilians despite the fact that they have the same nationality, on the assumptions that the latter belong to the opposed factions, that is, owe allegiance to the military and political structure of the opposed faction. Furthermore, technically speaking, in a civil war, civilians are not protected persons pursuant to the Geneva Conventions and Protocols. These problems affecting internal armed conflicts should be borne in mind when considering the various issues that accompany the question of pinpointing the nature and scope of the nexus.